Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, it's episode 105, September 10th, 2018. You're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. We're both wearing gray on gray, and the background is gray. It's just a vibrant office over here. It's an all-gray day on it's a, Monday. It's a gray Monday. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today. Google wants to kill the URL. Uh, we got this hyper-real robot. Did you see this thing? Uh, it'll cry and bleed all over med students. Uh, hyper-reality. <laughs> here we are. Got the world first. That might be debatable. We'll, we'll check it out. World first in decision-making AI and humanity launches an app uh, giving consumers legal control over their medical data. So that's that's a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about it a little later. Blake, what's going on with you, though? I want to jump right into this. All right, let's jump <laughs> right into the banter piece. All right. Yeah. Uh, not a whole lot, Nick. I actually have been going through a problem recently through Uh-oh. one of the projects that I've been working on of selecting a, a new framework to rebuild a website. I think there might be support groups for you. I hope there are, because I need the help. <laughs> Maybe Reddit can help me. So hang on. So break this down for me. This is new frameworks for UI. Yeah. So well, I've gotten a new project to actually sit down and try and redesign an old website. Okay. Like, a, and a, there's a there's a small team of people that are put working together to try and you know figure out how we can quickly do this within like a month turnaround. Time. Okay. Sure. Sure. So you're um, looking for something low cost of entry. Uh, high return on investment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and so typically for something like this, I would just say let's just use something we're all familiar with, so like a bootstrap type of thing or sure. a bootstrap four because that's pretty simple. I know the, te- the teammates I've worked with used it, but somebody brought up like, oh, we should use, I'm not going to name it because I found specific problems that I have with it, but a specific UI kit that just has a lot of components and they were like, oh, it's got a great large component library. And it's one of these things where you have to do your homework, right? Because it, it, at first, when I looked at the documentation, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I won't have to hardly write anything. I'm just going to grab and drop a bunch of components on a page and we'll be good to go. But what we do here or what we do for a job and then both like when you're designing a website, you want to be able to make sure that it's usable. And these interactions that are being introduced by a framework or something like this is, are not a bunch of strange interactions that you've never seen. Sure. I, I'm curious if you're using something that I might be familiar with to, uh, I, I won't name it. We'll talk about it offline, but, uh, yeah. All right. So that's, that's a challenge, right? So everyone's throwing around this, uh, this thing It's good with components, but maybe not, yeah, and it <laughs> got me back to the fact that I was like, okay, just because it has so many components does not mean it's a good choice. Right. Because uh, it's it's not as versatile, and I feel like it's going to re- cause a bunch of rewrites. So that that's what's been on my mind this week. So how do you deal with that? How do you how do you deal with potentially um, weighing the pros and cons of, of these different UI kits? Exactly doing that, <laughs> right? Because there, there was also an option to use something called like a CMS, something like WordPress, so like a content management system, sure. which there's a whole host of reasons that I was not for that because it's just not as flexible as something like building it with a U, UI kit or something that's like bootstrap that you can quickly put together. Right. Uh, but a lot of it is like setting out the pros and the cons and then seeing what the team comes to. Seeing how how everybody else feels about it, have they dug into the to the specific you know, uh, was it framework that we're all talking about, or are they just like saying because it's a new kind of hot thing that we should use it? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting challenge. I'm yeah. sure uh, you will keep me posted on what they end up going with. Um, I only I only am like doing the wink and nod thing because I know what you're talking about, but our listeners don't. <laughs> That's true. But what have you been up to, Nick? Because you had an interesting Friday. Uh, I did. So the local chapter of HFES, we all got together. We went to the SDG&E Innovation Center, and that's the local um, electricity and gas utility company down here in Southern California. Uh, and, um, you know, one thing that kind of struck me as we were there is um, – well, it, with museums or, or any sort of display pieces just in general is sort of this this capacity to incorporate this interactive piece into the way this information is displayed. So specifically, I'm thinking of an example here where, um, and if you're watching the video, you'll see the B-roll here where there's a, a sort of a... It's like a it's a display where you have three different types of lights. You have a normal incandescent, you have a fluorescent, and you have a... Um, uh, or a CFL, sorry, and then you have a uh, LED light. And below is there's a hand crank, 
And so if you crank this thing, you can physically feel the amount of effort required to light the light. And you can sort of switch on top of it which light you're controlling. So if you have it all the way on the left, you crank it. The, um, the incandescent bulb requires the most energy. So you, you have to crank it a little bit more, actually, to get the light bulb to illuminate. And then if you put it to the medium, the CFL, compact fl- uh, fluorescent, uh, light bulb, then that takes a little bit less effort. And then the LED takes like no effort at all. And so I was just thinking about how cool these interactive experiences are when trying to illustrate a concept, right? That whole thing is about energy expenditure and how much each type of light bulb requires. And to actually have you physically do something in order to illuminate them, I thought was really clever. Yeah, I think that's one of the only ways you could really understand the amount of, you know, maybe kinetic energy that has to be put into something to make it work, especially when we're talking about lights or what the benefits are between the various different types. So that's a really, I I wish more kind of museums or history exhibits were like that or they could be. Like I know the Exploratorium in like Northern California is a lot like that, like explaining physics concepts. There's a lot of interactive elements to it that really make and illuminate like different principles they're talking about make more sense. Yeah, I always find that stuff super cool. It's uh, it's really it's really neat, man. Like that, it hammers it home. Like I knew the difference between CFL, but when you can actually feel the difference, I don't know. It's it's something different. Changes the way you think about it. Yeah, LEDs only. Yeah, I also had Spider Man in here. I just. I, I know we're not gonna. We're trying not to talk about video games. But man, that's a good game. It's a really good game. It looks <laughs> amazing. All right, if you want to know my thoughts on Spider Man, come hit me up in the Slack. All right, so we got some uh, programming notes. We are on YouTube. I'm gonna beg again. Go like, subscribe. We need those subscribers to get our slash name. Uh, we also got that free registration to this year's annual meeting. The last day to enter is Friday of this week. If you're listening to this after Friday, I'm sorry you missed your chance. Uh, we have a link in the description. We are going to announce the winner on next week's show. Um, so look out for your an inbox messages an with inbox the emails. Message. <laughs> the email. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're back on Monday, folks. All right. So and we also got HFES coming up in just under a month. That's going to be tons of fun. We're still organizing it. We're still trying to figure out what we're doing there. It's going to be a busy week. Come say hi. We're going to have a booth and everything. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and then we got HFES Australia coming next month, uh, right around the time of Thanksgiving. So we will have, uh, here, at least here in the States, we'll have some coverage, though. We'll figure it out. All right. So, Blake, you know what time of the show it is. What time of the show is it, Nick? It's time of the show where I need to get my soundboard up and ready so I can hit this. Oh. Yeah, it's Human Factors News. That's right. <laughs> where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology. We've got some web science. What? I'm Spider-Man's on my brain, man. Some web web science? Web science. Yeah, that's what I'm talking ta- <laughs> We got a lot of stuff. Blake, what have we got up first this week? Well, so Google is trying to kill the URL. So Google Chrome's browser turned 10 last week, and in its short life, it's introduced a lot of radical changes to the web. From popularizing auto-updates to aggressively promoting HTTPS web encryption, the Chrome security security team is grappling grappling (laughs) with big conceptual problems. The team is actually now mulling over its most controversial initiative yet, so fundamentally rethinking URLs across the web. As web functionality has expanded, URLs have become increasingly more unintelligible strings of gibberish, combining components from third parties or being mistaken or masked by link shorteners and redirect schemes. On a mobile device, there really isn't even enough room to display a full URL at all, which results in this big boon in cyber criminals who build malicious sites to exploit this type of confusion. So they impersonate legitimate institutions launching phishing schemes, hawk malicious downloads, and run phony web services, all because it's difficult for web users to track, keep track of who they're dealing with. And now the Chrome team says time for a massive change. So Nick, what do you think this really means for our everyday kind of use of the web because a lot of Chrome is not really releasing the options they're trying to go with because it's, they're kind of trying to keep all of that under wraps. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I put a lot of thought into this and and it, it kind of, okay, we want to kill the URL, but what's the alternative, right? Like there's, we already have hyperlinks and that's kind of like a shortening of URLs and masking them behind uh, actual text. Right. So what's the next step? I, I, I don't, I just, I guess I'm a little confused. The idea 
would be to basically type something in your search bar. At least this is this is an application that I'm thinking of. You type something in your search bar where you want to go, and instead of a Google search, it just takes you to the the place, right? So like if I went um, to uh, if I if I searched for Human Factors Cast, it would just take me to our website rather than a Google search of everything. Um, and if you wanted to do a Google, I don't know. Like it's, I'm trying to think of what the alternative to a URL is, and I I'm just coming up short. Well, yeah, what you mentioned there, too, doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't make, make me feel all that comfortable, right? Because if, right. We're, if we're typing in, like, Human Factors Cast or Amazon, and it no longer is kind of redirecting based off the stuff you've typed in there to an actual website, but it's now funneling it through Google first. Sure. And then you're having, you're, like, adding that extra step yeah. or, like, now making it so that Google's always looped in. Um, I don't. I don't really know. The only thing I could think of is... You'd ha- if you're not going to any longer use kind of like the dot .com or any of that stuff that's associated with it, you're go- there's going to have to be some human-readable language that's going to key into whatever browser you're using, in this case Chrome, that you are trying to go directly to a website and you're not searching for something. And I, I don't know what that really means because you don't want to add funny operators into like, right. a, like something to say that it's a query because that's just going to throw people off and add a behavior. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what their solution to this is. This Wired story just says that they want to kill it, not not offering any sort of insight as to what they want to do to replace it. So I, I just thought it was a, a good thing to talk about and bring up and kind of think, well, what are the alternatives and what are the problems with URLs, right? And one of the things that they bring up is that it, it often is this lengthy string with just a bunch of, you know, characters that sort of tell you tell the device that you are operating from where to go on the world wide web and to me it almost seems like we need a re-indexing of the internet which is a massive undertaking to even get them in a semi-organized it's like when you have shared folders on a drive and everyone kind of has their own schema for organizing things and you want some sort of standardized schema in order to access information and it's not available, right? Like one person might say ABC and the other person might say one, two, three. And so by sort of unifying, don't laugh at me. Did you mean to do that? Yes. That's awesome. (laughs) What? (laughs) ABC one, two, three. Yeah, I meant to. (laughs) Anyway, if you have some sort of unified scheme, which I think Google might be pushing to mask, right? Like mask these uh, URLs with, um, I don't know, like human readable font and, and then push it. I don't know. Like I, I just, I just don't know. That's gotta be where it's moving to for in my head, because I mean, I would assume that they have enough, enough keywords associated specifically with different websites. Although I'm not, I'm not completely sure enough combination of keywords that have been used that help to like get that, that first hit that that's where it's going to take you automatically. But first hit's sa- always free. It's so cheese. But at the, at the same time, it, I feel like they're going to end up introducing a new way that you go about like trying to search for things, or they're going to yeah. go backwards almost. And because I don't know, I sometimes I hardly remember the fact that it didn't used to always be that you would just search through Google or any search engine from your browser bar. You would have to go to Google.com to do that. Yeah. So I don't know if they're if they're thinking about bringing that back to make that dif- differentiation between I'm trying to go straight to a website and then I I don't really know what like um, what's most readable for most people like is it just the name of the website you're trying to go to because not not every time you go to a website is the name indicative of what you're actually going to it may right be an acronym yeah exactly I don't know like it's it's tough right maybe. I don't. I. I just. I don't know. <laughs> I hate to say that I don't know, but honestly, this is. It's such a massive sort of paradigm shift when it comes to navigating the World Wide Web, right? I think they tried uh, these chips before, right? The data chips or whatever they're called. Uh, that sounds very science fictiony. I'm not. <laughs> yes, they've been uh, implanting chips the, in a few people just no, to make no, no. sure. What, what, what were the chips name? They were. They were chips. Origin chips. That's what they were called. Um, and they tried this back in uh, 2014, and it was a formatting feature um, where it kind of only showed the domain name of sites to help ensure that the users kind of knew which domain that they were actually browsing on, right? So, it, and you can see this, or or you can see it kind of on uh, it, on some websites. I know, like if you go to Amazon, it actually shows Amazon and like a little chip to the left of the URL, um, and y- you know you're within that domain. And so 
they're offering that as kind of a solution to um, you, not as a full solution to what we're talking about here, replacing the URL, but at least with that, you know which domain you're browsing at that time. That's true. That's a that's not a good or not a bad option. And one thing that might be possible, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking way out of turn with what I'm about to say, but I feel like with the amount of information that Google's collected related to the keywords that they have that are attached to websites or like the most hit, most keywords lead people to go to X site, I feel like machine learning might be helpful in that instance in, try, in kind of getting at what you were talking about with re-indexing the in, the web itself to try and put these really long kind of string strings of you know, text and domain names and all that stuff put together to a more like human readable function. But I'm not, I'm not really sure where they're going to go. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with. That's both like good from an everyday person's perspective, but also still meeting these security needs. Cause that's also mentioned in the article is like, they're really trying to focus on like how people use them now. And then what do you really have to do to enhance the security of them? Right. So just to follow up on that origin chip, I'm not seeing that anymore on the browser so i do remember it though like i don't know does that does that sound familiar it to doesn't you? sound familiar to me because i know i've seen it before I, I just did a test on my chrome and i didn't find it but maybe that's uh an artifact of having you know uh, uh the older version of chrome i don't know <laughs> it might be could be all right well do you we, 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 jump into the next story <laughs> let's get into the next story <laughs> all, right. all right so new robot hal was actually built to suffer He's a medical training robot, the sort of invention that emerges when one of the most stressful jobs on Earth tumbles into an uncanny valley. No longer must nurses train on lifeless mannequins. Hal can actually shed tears, bleed, and urinate on nurses during training. If you shine and a light in its eyes, its pupils will actually shrink. You can wirelessly control him to go into anaphylactic shock or cardiac arrest, and you can hook him up to a real hospital machine and even jolt him with a defibrillator. Hal, which is now coming onto the market, is so realistic and that these scenarios are so emotionally charged that instructors who run medical simulations using Hal usually have to be careful not to push things too far to upset the new trainees in the field. Nick, I, this this one is like really falling in the line between I can't even believe that it's that realistic and that they're having to you know bridge the line between for a job that's as stressful as being a nurse, like not scaring people with a mannequin to the the fact that this thing does look very very creepy yeah it's okay so it's a careful balance obviously between um realistic looking and functioning versus sort of the um <laughs> looking at the video <laughs> i'm sorry i can't even if, if you have the resources go check out this video because it uh hyper realistic is um it's a good good description for real i mean Look, it's probably hyper realistic with the functions, but I mean the facial features, not quite there. But uh, the idea here is that higher fidelity when it comes to training situations will hopefully transfer those skills to a real world context, right? So if they're able to train on this uh, this doll, this what is it, robot? I guess we're calling it not a doll. It looks like a human doll. Yeah, they do call it just a hyper real realistic robot. So yeah, so right. so by practicing on this robot, those skills are able to transfer over to the physical environment when they're uh, working on a real human person. Um, so I sounded like a robot there, a real human person. <laughs> but, I mean, the idea here is that you train on something that's going to emulate as close to the real environment as possible, and therefore you will be more prepared uh, this is the same thing to me as sitting in a flight simulator with, um, you know, so the, the actuators that, that give you sort of the, uh, the movement and the fully immersed cockpit that this is the same thing to me, but for, but for this. Yeah. And I think, I think this is a cool marriage between like robotics and, you know, lifelike simulations. Cause it used to be that they had to operate or do these kind of training simulations on a rubber dummy. And then you just would have to listen for, you know, what they call like the voice of God. So somebody in another room giving you indicators right. of what was going on. And in this case, you can even read the polls. Like the article says, you can even hook it up to some of the machines that are in the hospital. And it's kind of training, it's training nurses and, other trainees on something that's probably very difficult to deal with. And that's when you're dealing with an actual child. That's why it's kind of got these specific features that even some of the, the things that it can say, it'll like ask for its parents or ask you not to touch it and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's almost training people for a very hard situation to deal with anyway, with a robot. 
Uh, but I, something I did think that was interesting they mentioned in the article was that they they avoided the face looking very realistic. And I, I didn't really understand why at first, but I think with all of the other kind of features that they've added into it, what they talk about throughout the article is they just wanted to be able to convince trainees that it's real enough that it's effective, but it's not something that they're scared to interact with, that it that it is an actual real person or a real child who's freaking out or doesn't want them to interact with it like in a medical setting. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, what is the right level of fidelity, right? Because you have to let them know that this is not a real environment and to kind of train the person who is behind the operation, the operating tools or the cockpit or whatever you're in, right? Train them to understand that these are stressful situations, but also not make it so real that they can't perform the task that they are trying to do. I don't know. It's an interesting, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to go about striking that type of balance in something like this that's so stressful with a potentially that many variables. I mean, you're dealing with a human body that can go into any amount of different kind of conditions, but then we're like put like in the as the video shows, you're dealing with like machines, other people in the room during the procedures, different devices you may or may not have to use depending on what you're dealing with or what you're having to treat. So I, I think this is. I think some of the ideas that they may or that they decided to go with in terms of like, don't make it look too real, but give it enough that it can provide those like stressful points of a situation was a really good balance for them. Do you ever watch the office, the episode with the CPR training dummy? No. (laughs) Oh my God. This reminds me exactly of that where Dwight cuts off the face and (laughs) okay. (laughs) All right. I'll show it to you after this. It's really great. That's epic. I just gave a little, uh, little, what was it? Easter egg for, for some of our listeners. Uh, did, I mean, do you have, like, I don't know. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this? I don't know what else to say other than this is great. Um, the more realistic we can make these training environments, the better. Uh, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on this one, Blake? I think it's just unbelievable that they're actually able to, like, simulate a lot of things like uh, anaphylactic shock or cardiac arrest. But then I, the one thing that's blowing my mind is just being able to interact with machines. Like, I don't, I don't know, like, how how easy it is and i'm sure there's like a, a probably a good bit of prep for a scenario but i, I don't know i've been in some of the, like the hospital test ser- test scenario areas and there's a lot that goes into putting those things together so something like this just seems to bring it like one step above what is a, is in existence now yeah i don't know maybe it's the fact that there's blood but that that to me is kind of the uh wow this is this this feels real and the fact that it can talk to you and its mouth is moving. Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. like one-to-one, but yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's really interesting, and I uh, highly suggest you go check out that video if, if you're listening to this, because it's a, it's a pretty interesting robot person. All right, so we'll, we have a couple more news stories. We'll be back to break those down right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon. Now more than ever, pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember... It depends. Okay, we're back. Uh, before we move on, though, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Wired, TechCrunch, and AUT University for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles, and we post those as we find them. Okay, Blake, we got we got this uh, this next one up here. and um, we Controversial got, a little bit. I don't know. Let's talk about it. All right, speaking of AUT, so AUT researchers have developed an artificial intelligence model which can predict a person's choices before they have even made up their mind. Work is based on a new type of artificial intelligence research called Spiking Neural Networks, which was used to develop NuCube, a machine learning system modeled on how the human brain learns and recognizes patterns. In several experiments, the algorithm was able to predict 
participants' reactions 0.2 seconds before they consciously perceive the stimulus. This work has a number of applications, including neuromarketing, cognitive studies, and crime solving. Wow, that's pretty intense. You know what scares me out of all those applications is neuromarketing. So, yep. So knowing you want to buy something before you even know what it is, potentially. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There's anyway. that. <laughs> all right. So, Blake, I want to address one thing. So the title of this article is um, World's First in Decision-Making AI. And we don't... How do I approach this? How do I approach this? Because uh, when you... You chose this story, kind of. You, did. you you came to me and said, Nick, let's talk about this. Yep. And I came back to you and I was like, is it though? Is it the first? Is well, it? <laughs> it's funny because it's definitely not the first one on Human Factors Cast. Right. And, you know, I probably should have done the prep work to really go back and dig and find the one that was, that we could say, is this really the world's first? Um, but I, I don't Why know. Why didn't you? I don't really This know. is a weekly podcast, Blake, where we put in... Tons of hours of R and D. All of the hours that we have. That's what we do <laughs> so from nine to five. Forty hour work week, and you have not. <laughs> I have not gone back to our back catalog and found the story. I'm gonna get fired, folks. <sighs> uh, I'm not gonna fire you. You're the only one that'll sit and talk with me for an hour. All right. <laughs> anyway, I don't think you, that's true. But any, anyhow, maybe New Cube will make the decision for you. Yeah. So you were saying. So you chose this article, and I came to you, and I was like, "No, this is not the first time we've seen this." Yeah. And. Uh, the, the thing that I guess irks me is that this, I'm not going to like spend this whole time talking about how much this article irks me, but. Oh, he will. No, I won't. Uh, so the thing that, <laughs> the thing that irks me is that first off, it says world first when clearly it's not. And the second is that it calls it decision-making AI. And that's not really what it's doing. Yeah, the AI right. is not making decisions. It's the AI predicting what decision the human will make. Okay. So, Picking apart the title aside, whatever, doesn't doesn't matter. Let's actually pick apart this research here. So this is basically using a neural network to predict what a human participant will choose in these experimental studies. Um, and it looks like, you know, it's able to pick these things up 0.2 seconds before um, the, the participant actually chooses. And to me, this sounds like a P wave. It sounds like it's an uh, it's an algorithm analyzing a P wave that then um, I, don't, I don't know how the algorithm works or how how P waves work really I just know it's like a it's like a pre uh, wave that happens in your brain before something happens right okay so I'm gonna feel a little silly here is P wave related to you know ERP in your brain like kind of the the different electrical signals that you can pick up from your brain's activity. That allow you to ca- dis- discern where in the decision ma- making process you might be, or as well as we understand it right now. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not a P wave expert, and you, you can fire me for not spending my 40 hours last week for <laughs> looking up P waves. But um, let's see here, PGO PGO waves, maybe that's potentio occipital waves. I don't know gotcha. if that's right. I don't know if that's right. Anyway, the P waves kind of they. They fire off before the human makes a decision. Yeah. Or, and, and so you can detect these with EEG, and uh, it almost seems like this study is operating off of those. I'm not quite sure, but... No, I think you're probably right. Okay, so let's let's kind of break it. I want to break down let's what break they actually it. did a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's break it. Okay, so let's talk about what they did in these experiments. Okay, sure. so they had 20%... Yeah. 20 participants watch a video of different, you know, beverage logos and recorded those participants brain using an EEG headset. All right. Okay. So EEG. So like, likely Boom. you're right. They're recording some kind of brain function and making decisions based off of it. Right. So that data is then synced to the new cube. So this is what's using the spiking neural network uh, slash machine learning algorithm that's been combined. And so the new cube then learned and classified patterns from the participants brains. So then it's able to predict their beverage choice 0.2 seconds before they were consciously able to perceive what the beverage is. Okay. So it also showed a, diff- a clear difference between logos, which it was familiar with and those th- which the participants were not. Okay. So that's, that's almost not enough information for me. Nope. Not me neither. And uh, again, I'm not here <laughs> to tear that apart. Uh, and one thing I did want to actually talk, go and, you know, 
you know, try not to harp on it, but bring back what you said about the fact uh, that this is not the first time we're seeing this. I think what a lot of that is having to do with, or the the naming of this, is the the new the newness the newness the newness of the artificial intelligence model. So like combining the new both, cube. Like, yeah, the new cube, new any you. So I think it's I think it's the so bringing together this spiking neural networks with this machine learning model, and I think that's what's brand new and maybe what is determining as being like the first in decision making AI. But again, I mean, I think you bring up a really good point. It's more so predicting the choices somebody's going to make, not necessarily making any decisions based off of that choice. If that's not too convoluted. Yeah, I got it. Let's okay. So yeah, let's stop shitting all over this and let's start actually talking about the application here because I feel I feel like the application is the part that we have the most rich discussion and, and sort of the the piece that um, offers the best you know, sort of the insight best. into uh, humanity. I don't Probably. know, or maybe not. Neuromarketing, we talked about that could be potentially really dangerous. Well, so now I see what they're what they're um, sorry, what they really mean by neuromarketing and how this will play into it. So it's right. it's kind of a fun, uh, fun you know situation. I don't I don't know is necessarily know that it's getting in there and helping you, or the AI is kind of helping you make that decision. But I think I think the application here is, and we we can't really get any deeper than speculation, but I think the application for neuromarketing would be that based off of an understanding of your preferences for, in this case, let's say like beverages, beverage logos, brands, it would target market you better, more precisely to a, to like a subconscious level. Yeah. Does that make any sense? So it maybe yeah. you can understand like it based on your past brain function and your past like shopping habits, it's able to, you know, predict on a dime what to show you and when to show it to you to make you purchase. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Is it cool or is it scary? It's spooky uh, to me. Yeah. I think it's both. Um, I, I don't know. I was always really excited and stoked on neuroscience when I was in like just undergrad. Okay. So you're nerding out from it, from a neuroscience perspective and I'm freaking yeah. out about it from a consumer perspective. Yeah. And okay. I'm kind of freaking out at it at it from a neuroscience perspective because i mean think about if you're able to like from from an eeg determine that a signal may mean this is the decision you are subconsciously making and i can tell you you're about to make that decision yep how nuts is that that's pretty nuts i mean i don't know what how old am i almost 30 years old so like seven years ago when i was still undergrad we were trying to figure out just how what the amygdala was doing and like really pinpoint that now we're talking about we can actually from very, it's not basic, but very almost rudimentary EEG EEG measurements, you can almost determine what somebody might may may do. Right. I'm thinking about this from the application. That's all scary and exciting too, because of the advances. But I'm thinking about this um, in tense situations. I mean, we work in the defense industry, and so I'm, it's hard not to think about it from that kind of perspective, right? Where let's let's say something that you and I are fairly disconnected from, so we can speak about it with with um, with a great free, connection freely, uh, like a pilot, right? So you have a pilot that is in a tense situation, and let's say the plane it kind of understands what the pilot's intent is. Um, like let's say it's in a dogfight, right? Its intent is t- survival and um, so it would then understand the intent of the pilot seconds before the pilot actually went to go make that move. And so by activating that intent and sort of not like linking into the plane, but sort of thinking the motion before it happens, the, the plane would be that much more responsive and you're almost like thought controlling the plane. I could see that as being an insane application of something like this, where it's almost predicting movements and preparing them just like to make you that 2.2 seconds faster than if you are right. by yourself. So it's yeah. truly augmenting the human. Sure. And if you, the, the real benefit to this would be compounded um, prediction, right? So if you, if you predict five movements, right, that is then a second that you are saving. So compound that over time where you're making thousands of decisions like every minute you're saving a lot of time to maneuver this craft well uh, so let's let's take that just a (laughs) let's get a little bit even i don't know even deeper into the problem hole that we're jumping into right is think about this as like a multi-barrier problem where every time you go to make that point to 
second decision and the system's able to aid you think about the fact that you may be may, may be setting off like a combination of decisions that could go one of two ways right and so think about the intensity of whatever neural network or machine learning algorithm that's going to have to sit under this kind of this technology that's going to learn from you over time to help increase like okay not only am I saving you 0.2 seconds here, but now I've learned this combination of movements that you may make in the future. Right. And so that, that 0.2 seconds now is, like you said, amplified. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. Oh, and can you imagine like applying this to training scenarios where the neural network learns the pilot's behaviors in a training scenario so that way you don't actually have to do it in a dogfight, right, or in dangerous situations. You do it in training environments. The neural network adapts to what you would do. And then when you're in a real scenario – You've already trained the system, so then it would make those decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. Well, it's almost, it's almost at a point you might be able to remove an operator from something that's dangerous. Yeah, I mean that was the that would be the hope, right? Is to completely remove any human from dangerous situations, and then uh, just have a AI fly. Yeah, at some point it it should, have, but potentially have sh- should have learned all of the possible combinations and then maybe even more that we're not able to make. Yeah. Well, and and so just to qu- give a quick little tease, the after show party today is going to be about ethics. So we could talk about the ethics of potentially letting AI in charge of these decisions that in which, you know, could potentially take lives or save lives or anything like that. I, I think that's a that's a great topic for us to talk about tonight yeah or even where what does that distinction mean when we're talking about ai yeah does it mean to the ai potentially anyway all right anyway all right so the the key by the way listeners to getting on human factors cast is obviously um make a title that nick doesn't like he'll select it and rip it apart and then you'll actually have a really thoughtful conversation about the application of whatever it is you're studying (laughs) So you you usually ask me if I have any closing thoughts here, so I'm just going to throw them out. Jump in. Do it. You know what I would really love to know where the, the idea is coming from is to actually talk to the people that conducted the study and ask them about the crime-solving aspect of it because I, f- I feel like that could be a very interesting application of something like this. I just don't know where it specifically fits. Yeah. Um, Because I, I feel like it almost allows you, like in a very stressful situation, let's say if you're a detective – to either make better decisions because it's helping you kind of train mm. or it's predicting decisions you might make and maybe leading you down the right path versus making incorrect. How about this a police lineup? Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. You could, you could detect who they're going to choose before they actually choose it. And there's a lot of problem with police lineups and this might give some sort of, um, extra evidence right towards one person being selected because it could be like they realize who they're going to choose but they may not want to choose it because they're not sure because uh, there's a lot of problems with police lineups i don't want to get into it right now but uh, a lot of people are falsely accused and convicted because of police lineups and there's a lot of problems with the framing of the lineups too like the the various uh, attributes that someone can have physically that can influence somebody, right? So if you have that predictive piece in there, they can almost see who, if, if there's something there, I don't know, like I'm, I'm trying to skirt around this, but if, if the perpetrator is truly in that lineup, you might be able to detect it with something like this. Uh, even if the, um, the person doesn't realize it's them, I'm not sure. How to well, the, yeah. So there's almost a, and maybe I'm, misreading the what's in between the lines here but there's almost a possibility for something like this to remove bias from situations that may or may not fall into like fall victim of that often right yeah i'm i'm trying to yeah i'm skirting around that right i don't want to say this could remove bias i'm saying that could potentially be one extra data point but um, i would be really cautious about using this to replace bias or to offset bias. Um, but yeah, yeah, could definitely, I can see it being used in a police lineup. There you go. <laughs> All right. We have one more story. Why don't we get into it? All right. So humanity wants to change the way that we share data by giving people legal ownership with contractual enforcement handled by handled on the blockchain. On the blockchain. I love it. So the first foray with 
will be with medical data. And last week, the company debuted the hashtag My31 app. The name refers to the company's core beliefs that data ownership should be a human right. The current United Nations Declaration of Human Rights include 30 core principles. The startup is exploring the idea of making data ownership the 31st human right central to its approach and how it markets the service. When users download the app, they can sign up for the service and set the terms and conditions on how they would like their data to be used. So humanity's goal is to give app users the ability to set terms for sh- of sharing data, defining those who can use it and under what conditions, and even getting paid for giving access to their data. The app uses blockchain as an enforcement component for a user-defined rules. And when you claim ownership to your data, the company assigns a it signs you a title, a legal document, and all that entails. So I'm, I'm actually surprised we haven't seen a whole lot more of these as as all the problems rolled out with Facebook recently and even a lot of companies kind of changing the, the way that they're handling privacy policies. I have a feeling that's why we're seeing this, right? Data privacy over the last year, and we've seen this uh, with a lot of the stories that we covered. Um, data privacy over the last year has sort of grown into an exponential issue where we are now concerned with how our data is being used, especially because of um, the elections in the United States. A lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of data behind the scenes that's being used to influence what things we see. And um, also sort of these privacy policies have been put into place to help us manage what data the system can access and what it's being used for. And, this is just one more thing, right, with with medical data now. So to me, it makes sense. And I, I think a lot of this comes from that. Yeah, I mean, it's got to, right? I mean, it, there's no reason why like they would just out of nowhere start seeing a bunch of apps or any kind of services related to these these data sharing issues. But we've, like, over the past, I feel like two years, really, why we've been doing this podcast, we've seen data breach after data breach and now we've had these issues with facebook come out and also like you're talking about the political climate that we find ourselves in and how did we get here potentially because of influences of data but also too i think it's important for apps like this to come out when it's something so personal as medical data and you really feeling like you have one a legal title to it like it is absolutely yours but i find it interesting that you're actually able to set how it's used and i I wonder the repercussions of that. And I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot that humanity is trying to do for different apps and services that are integrated with them or that they interact with when they're sharing out this data. But what, what happens if you start, you know, of different types of data, whether it's your financial, your medical, whatever it may be, and you start denying applications and services to using it? I mean, do you just stop right. being able to use that service? I mean, is there any kind of workaround? What really happens? Yeah, I'm not sure. I just want to go over this example that they they spell out here in this TechCrunch article. They kind of say, so for example, you could decide a particular drug company uh, could use your data, but only for a single trial for a given price. And then it couldn't sell your data to another party after that trial ends. So they couldn't use your data in any follow-on studies. It's just that one thing. And you have that control. And I think that's really important to kind of be in charge of our data that way, right? If... I don't know. I'm of two minds of this. Big surprise. Big surprise, right? Two of them. Um, So on one hand, yes, this is very good for the consumer. This is good for the average Joe. This means they can take control of their data. This means they can prohibit companies and researchers from using their data in um, potentially ways that could be used to... Uh, extort money, if, if that makes sense, or or to advertise towards someone that, um, help me out here, Blake. You know what I'm saying, though, right? Like, data can be used against you, and data is valuable. So, also on the same hand, so or I guess on the other hand, uh, that's that's the first one was from the consumer. This one's from me as a data scientist. I want as much data as I can. And the more data I get, you know, obviously my intentions are to help people. I'm a human factors practitioner. I'm, it's all about helping the person do their job or, or, you know, do the thing that they want to do or protect them in some way. Um, and so by locking out your data, 
and and denying me access to their data, I can't help you. And so I see both points. Yeah, and I think you I think <laughs> you bring up a really good like argument and then counter argument to it of both sides of the fence, right? So you've got the consumer versus like somebody like a data scientist, but I, I also think there's the the third side of it that I'm hoping that through services like like what is it called? My thirty thirty one app and i'm assuming others are going to be coming out if they don't already exist and maybe we'll talk about them here on the show but i i hope that services like this start helping us get away from a lot of like the dark patterns we've seen with replacing your terms and services agreements like because now if if people actually have control over their data well if enough people say that they're not going to allow you to use data for whatever it is in this case medical is a little bit different but even if it's like accessing social networks, using a, using a website, those kind of things, I mean, enough people on enough volume that could really make an impact on your business. And that could sure. change how you you know, you know approach your own like user base. And so I feel like that light could be good. Um, but at the same time, when, when we're talking about something that's in the medical field, if you have less data that if you have less data that you have access to when you're doing something like drug trials or trying right. to make trends based off of what you're seeing it's it's a really kind of hard and fine line at the same time it's like no this is somebody else's data but i can't make as informed decisions without it right what do you do i will say as potentially a uh a third option right if companies want data they'll get data they'll pay for it uh, especially if it will help make them money down the line and so what this app is or what this uh, story is suggesting is that this this app would allow you to specify how much your data is worth and um i'm sure companies would have algorithms to take the cheapest data and pull it in if, if it's not readily available and so you know one one potential solution for something like this where you still want to help people like you and i is to say hey uh any public research that's funded by the government or by grants let's go ahead and i'm going to give all my data to them for free because I know they're not for profit. They're ge- genuinely doing research to progress the field. Whereas um, potentially a company could be, um, you know, uh, more trying to make the money, more for profit. And so I want to lock all those behind uh, a, a money gate. And so I, I can see that. Be, but, but you need that option to, like, opt into all the public domain stuff. You know, and just have a blanket like, hey, anything that doesn't is not funded by a private company. I want I want my data to go there because like, I don't know. I That's what I would want. Well, this is kind of the fun part about thinking about a blockchain technology like this, right? Because they have to have, especially for something that is like your medical data where you could be running into these problems right. where it's a bunch of where it is for profit or not for profit or what you really want or what kind of options should a user have access to and does the technology support the capabilities that they for the decisions they want to make um i don't know this is a great great find so i'm glad that you picked this one i actually didn't pick this one this one came from mateo in our uh our weekly stories if you Even find it better i know if you find a story jump in uh jump in the slack and post it and and we might talk about it so this one this one was for you mateo and and uh i, I, I guess it's for everyone really but because you picked it we uh we talked about it. All right, Blake, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? No, I don't. I just, I've, I'm just i glad that Mateo threw that in there, though, because I like seeing the application of blockchain into something simpler, not simple, but simpler that I can really grasp and try and understand. All right. Well, you know what time of the show it is. It came from. It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. So any subreddit is fair game for this, as long as it promotes discussion amongst the community. It's fair game. Uh, so this week, <laughs> I almost went to you, Blake. This week we have... Uh, that over to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I usually read these. All right, so <laughs> it's been too long. It's been six days. All right, so I had picked this one. Uh, did I remove too much information from my resume for the sake of free space and visual hierarchy? Now, this is obviously a very specific example. Um, and they go on to write, you know, they're, they're, here's my resume. Here's what it was before. Here's what it is after. I don't want to get into all that. What I want to talk to you. Oh, wait, you know what? I should probably, you know, credit the user. <laughs> this is on the user experience subreddit by, uh, Let's see. I'll get the name here in just a minute. You can tell we're prepared. 40 hours a week. It's by uh, user Love Mockdown. Yes. All right, that's like mock-up. Yeah. 
So what a hate mock-up is there. Anyway, uh, anyway, so the point of this one here is to provide some sort of general guidance for resumes and what information you display, what information you leave off. And obviously this will be different depending on what your experience is and what um, sort of job you're going for. But I feel I figured this would be kind of a fun thing to discuss. I think you're right. Okay. So, Blake, I'm going to toss it over to you. <laughs> what kind so, of information, just in general, should somebody have on their resume? If, the, like, let's say they're a human factors practitioner. They're a human factors practitioner. Yeah, I think even in a broad sense, the the one thing that either makes it or breaks it for a resume for me, because I had to review a fair, fair amount recently, is the personal statement at the top. Like, I don't want to feel like, again, in, it, there is a careful balance that you have to strike and it's very hard to update your resume um, and kind of not write too much, but write enough that it makes sense and gives some context for who you are. But I think those really help you kind of talk about like, what's my past experience at a broad level and how am I, what am I passionate about doing with what, the experience that I have? I think that's probably the most important part to me on a resume because you can they, you can see the technical skills that people have. They'll typically list that. I mean, I like to see the, the breadth of what people have done previously, but a lot of resumes is to help you get in the door, I know. And I, I mean, you obviously use that to try and you know gauge what pe- ask them about their process, about the products they've created, get really dive deep into what they've done. So I'd I'd say for the meat of the resume where you're listing, you know, the places you've been, how long you've been there, try and be as specific about the things that you yourself actually did. Boom. The as you can. Yeah. Because that's probably going to be the first thing people are going to ask you if you're too broad. They'd be like, okay, so what did you actually do? And if you haven't thought about that and don't have great answers for it, that's going to hurt you during an interview. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Blake. So I. I will say, though, that on a resume, um, less can be more. I, 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 When I see, personally, when I see a resume come through the door and it is loaded up with stuff, you know, um, I often kind of go, okay, they're trying to pack way too much into this. They are not good at sort of uh, reducing the amount of information to convey to me what their skills are. Um, with that said, if you have like a full page that is like completely from end to end text, I I probably won't. I'll read it still because it's my job. But you know, it's like I I feel like you're trying too hard to fit too much on the page. A very important skill to me is to be able to clearly, concisely communicate your skills. And so, if you can't communicate your skills in like one to two sentences per project go back to the drawing board, try to do it again because that's, that's what it means to me is like, okay, I can tell by these one to two sentences, what you did, like, like your point there, Blake, what you did, what it is that your skill set was for this project and um, what the results were. That's what I want to know. And yeah, I think that's the biggest thing employers look for, like the the outcome statements yeah. of what you're writing. Yeah. Uh, I will say one other point. Have you seen those resumes? I'm not knocking on anyone in particular. Have you seen those resumes that have like the uh, the CSS and the uh, all the all the technical languages or whatever, and they have like the little bar for proficiency? Oh yeah, I have. How do you feel about those? Uh, I don't like it. I hate I, it because if I see <laughs> if I see too many technical languages, I start to question if you're any good at one of them. Sure. I mean, to me, it's it's the bar that gets me. It, it's like well that's a subjective measure. You're measuring your own proficiency where like I might want somebody who's 75% good with CSS, but my standard is different from your standard. And so you are then rating yourself and it's like, they're all going to be inflated because you want to put on your best self on your resume. I hate those things. Don't do the bars. Don't do the bars. Yeah. And only that's list what you're bar. actually, you know, proficient and b- proficient, meaning, you know, how, if, if you had to, in the next few days, I don't know, build something and build a prototype in CSS and HTML, you could actually do it. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm of two minds on that because again, I'm two minds. It depends. Uh, the, the, um, yes, but at the same time, like I could relearn those skills, right? Like I did CSS a long time ago, HTML a long time ago. If we were at a pinch, I could probably slap something together 
my skills aren't there. When they were there, they were there. I mean, I don't know. It's, I will say this, this leads me to another point though. If you have done something, whether it's CSS, HTML, or even injected rats with ketamine, uh, put it on, put it on a master resume that says, I've done this thing. Document everything that you have a skill for or that you have done before in the past. And I use that very specific example of injecting rats, uh, male sprag dollies with ketamine, because that is a skill that I thought I would never need again in my life. But I put it on my resume just in case. Uh, And it's a skill that I got in a lab, a lab class, right? And that's not uh, that's not something that I do. That's not something that I'm interested in. But it's on my resume and if I ever find myself in that situation, I can always go back to that and say, hey, yeah, I've done that before. So I guess what I'm trying to say, all that to say is, if you're not that great at CSS and HTML, put it on your master resume as something you once did, but not on the one that you're applying with. Yeah, I'd, <laughs> I would hesitate on putting anything, like on a CV, yeah, put everything and its mother that you ever have done. But when you're talking about a resume, I, I just encourage people to be very careful that no matter what of it what it is, if you say you know how to put together a usability test plan, if you know how to use Sketch, if you know how to like build a prototype and job with JavaScript, be prepared to like if you had to do those things in an interview or answer questions in a way that it's gonna indicate you actually have proficiency. Because there's more and more things that are happening in interviews where people are getting you know design challenges where they right. have to go through or actual application challenges where you have to you know. Okay, talk me through how you would build a usability test plan. Sure, and I will say that a resume is very similar to an academic paper. If you put a reference on an academic paper, that means you have read every word of that paper and you are citing it in its entirety. And a resume is very similar. If you are putting something on that paper, that means you can do that job or that skill or that is truthful. Uh, And that is what I expect of you as someone who reviews resumes as they come through the door. Yeah, and one... I don't know if this is what what you plan on doing for this, but one like small tip for this kind of stuff is it it can, sometimes you, it's been a long time since I've, you know, run a simulation for, you know, ATC airspace type stuff, but I've done that in the past. Yeah. And so one thing that has helped me in being able, being prepared to answer questions about like something I've done, you know, almost a long time ago now, I don't want to think about it is right out as almost a, not really worrying about the, the like, narration or anything but write it out as a story about what you actually did in that specific role that's great yeah and tell the story yeah because then you're ready to tell it if somebody yeah. asks you about it and it'll help you get those like one sentence one-liners about here's what i did this is what the outcomes were type of stuff yeah all right any other closing thoughts on resume tips and tricks don't sacrifice the information that you're trying to provide for aesthetics, but it is a fine balance. Yeah, don't don't sacrifice it. Don't do it. All right, well, that's going to be it for today. Enter that contest. Tweet at HFactors Podcast and at HFES with the hashtag HFCast. Got a link in the show notes. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. We got one coming your way all about ethics. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H-Factors Podcast. Drop us a comment on our SoundCloud. Like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Be sure to like, subscribe. I already said all that. Do it on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Uh, If you want to join the After Show Party, you can uh, support us on Patreon at patreon.com. Slash Human Factors Cast. Stop laughing. Like, this is how I exit. Join the party. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners go and find you if they want to watch you streaming, uh, what is it, Call of Duty Black Ops? Oh, Blackout tonight. Blackout. Yes. Okay, yeah, you're doing that. You all right. You guys can find me at all the places, including Twitch at Don't Panic UX. All right, special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. That's a good one. Worked out pretty well.